Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Land, Land Power in Europe and Africa Contemporary Military Forum. I'm Gordon Stein. I'm an executive at General Dynamics Land Systems. I've been part of the, this industrial complex for close to 40 years. Uh, I love what we do to serve you all. Uh, we appreciate the Association of the United States, the Army does, uh, for the total Army through educating and informing and connecting on exhibit once again this year at AUSA's annual meeting. General Dynamics Corporation and General Dynamics Land Systems are proud supporters of AUSA. At Land Systems, we strive to develop and deliver uh, the world's best combat fighting vehicles for the nation's most treasured customers, those soldiers and Marines that will fight and win in our nation's future battles. Um, and those most difficult last few kilometers in the battle. Thank you for joining us for the program. I turn the floor now over to Dr. Jack Watling, Senior Research Fellow for Land Warfare of the Royal United Services Institute, who will introduce today's panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be with you all this afternoon. Um, now, I've had the privilege of working with AUSA for the last five years. And over that time, our colleagues in AUSA have been at the forefront of driving the conversation, the intellectual engagement over land power and its application. Uh, when I first was working with AUSA, they were already commissioning brilliant studies uh, on the lessons that we needed to learn from Ukraine at that point and commissioning work from junior officers, uh, from a range of academics, pushing our conversation forward. Um, but it's not just the forum, the intellectual forum, which our panel today is going to contribute to. It's also the work in integrating the total force. Um, I think one of the key lessons that we've seen over the last two years with Ukraine is that industry is absolutely critical to our capacity to fight. Um, and it's also AUSA's responsibility to engage with and advocate for soldiers, their families, uh, and the challenges that that force faces, and to be able to inform and educate. Um, and, you know, AUSA has 122 chapters across nine countries at this point, but its mandate to advocate is dependent upon membership. That's what gives us its mandate. So if you're not a member, then I'd recommend you go over to where the registration area is, and you can sign right up. The booths are just on the other side. Um, but today, we have a great panel uh, focusing on the utility of land power in Europe and Africa. And that is a pretty wide span of territory to consider. Um, so I'm just going to do a bit of scene setting before we dive into the topic. You know, um, This time last year, I had the privilege of being on a stage at AUSA, and we were marveling as four brigades of Ukrainian troops collapsed the Russian Western group of forces. And we were wondering exactly how long it would take for the Ukrainians to make further progress. Since then, the Russians have adapted and they have learned. And over the last four months, they have so far prevented Ukraine trying to deploy three cores of troops from breaching their lines in depth. And so when we look at what's happening in terms of Russian industry, force generation, and the refinement of their concepts of operation and how they are fighting, they're learning, they're coming back, and we are contemplating a year uh, that's going to be really hard because we have expended a lot of munitions trying to stabilize uh, the Ukrainian war effort, which means that we are looking at a persistent threat in Europe and a severe one. And we have a lot of agency in determining how things go but we can't let down our guard. Now, at the same time, uh, I remember back in 2015, it was the first time I actually spent some time with some Ukrainian troops. Um, they flew me up to Timbuktu. I was working with the Burkina Faso Army, and um, at that time, the peace agreement had just been signed with the Tuareg, uh, between the Malian government and the Tuareg. Things were looking like they were getting better. But at that point, the Fulani uh, movement started to work with Al-Qaeda. We saw a significant increase in terrorism. And since then, terrorism has not just expanded across the Sahel, but many of our relationships in the region have become challenged. The Malian government has just decided that it would rather work with 1,000 Russian mercenaries 
than with 5,000 French soldiers and all of the enablement that was coming with it. And so there are real challenges in Africa which will directly impinge upon the European theater if we don't address them in a smart way, not least the fact that migration from Africa, if it is destabilized, and that is something that the Russians are uh, opportunistically pursuing, will create political problems in Europe, and that puts strain on our cohesion in maintaining our readiness to deter in the East. Um, and so when you start looking at this problem and these problem sets, actually they become very, very interrelated. Uh, and so it's a real privilege to be able to host a discussion uh, with General Darrell Williams, the commander of US Army, Europe, and Africa, who has to cohere these various lines of effort, um, with Ambassador Davis Barr, who is uh, the US ambassador in Cote d'Ivoire and represents the diplomatic side of the effort, and with Lieutenant General Passi Velamaki, who is the commander of NATO's newest member, uh, Finnish Land Forces. And so with that, I would turn over to General Williams to offer his initial remarks. Thanks, Doctor. Well, welcome, everybody. And it's good to see so many of the allies, partners, and friends in the audience. Uh, as uh, Jack mentioned, I'm the commanding general of United States Army, Europe, and Africa with a bunch of hats. Uh, I know many of you all know that. Um, I have a great opportunity to work on the continent of Africa in Europe with so many of my allies and, and partners in the room. So I thought maybe I would unpack a little bit about that uh, to help set the stage for questions you might have. So in Wiesbaden, and uh, been there for some time now, but I have a lot of teammates. So let me just sort of talk about my Usura hat, my Army hat, working for Chris Cavoli, UCOM commander, theater commander. Also support Mike Langley in Stuttgart, AFRICOM commander as a theater commander. Got a lot of help from Todd Wasman, who's down in CTAF, a job I had before. And then where I'll talk a little bit about, the biggest change is in NATO. This little green badge I'm wearing right here, now as the Allied Lane Commander NATO. And I also did that job before. So I didn't do any of those jobs very well because they asked me to come back and do both of them again, I guess. But uh, it's my privilege. What I will tell you up front is that I love the job. Um, our allies are tremendous. Uh, I don't really, they're friends. They're friends of mine. Martin, they're all in the room here. Uh, and we have a lot of help to do what we have to do. So with my Europe hat to General Chris Cavoli, as the all things you come, um, I have a theater fires command, Andy Ganey, who's in Wiesbaden with me. The 21st, uh, Ron Reagan, who's a little bit, about an hour away from me in, in, in K-Town. Uh, Tommy, who's up front here, who's the MCOM variant there that runs all things, uh, installations and posts on, on the continent of Europe. He has a tremendous, big job. He does it so well every single day. 10th double AMDC, Air Defense, uh, Mo Barnett does a great job. Uh, and then 7th ATC, uh, a real powerhouse, uh, Steve Carpenter down at Grafenvir. But, you know, I, this is my 40th year in the Army, and I started in Germany as a second lieutenant going to Grafenvir where the roads weren't paved then. They were all now paved for the Corps has kind of folks in the room here. But um, I will tell you that those teammates, and I didn't mention them all, I've got a great deputy, Andy Rowling, and a chief who may be in here, a great command sergeant major in the back, Jeremiah Inman, that allow me to do that at scale. But it gets to my first <clears throat> line of effort, and that's setting the theater. And we do that every single day. Uh, I've been doing it, we, we re, it resets itself. Uh, a lot of the enablement that Jack talked about, that we work with our Ukrainian partners, is facilitated by these generals at scale downstream. So all the downtrace units, and they partner with all the allies in the room whether it be in Africa or whether it be in Europe. Um, uh, John Kalaszewski leads a lot of the effort. He's in the room, the Fifth Corps commander. He is the day-to-day -day face, if you will, the assure and deter mission, and really the face for me with our partners here. They all know him. Uh, I think John speaks about 15 languages, and uh, he's in and out. He's got the most traveled man in Europe, uh, partnering with all of our allies here. And, uh, and it's not all one way. You know, sometimes, you know, we think that what we're going to tell, we have as much to learn from our allies and partners as we get in. John facilitates that. And then my downtrace units um, train at Grafenvir 
And what do you mean by that? Well, last December I, I asked if, you know, I, I got a tasker to start training. We trained four Ukrainian brigades down at Grafenvir. I don't know if any of my German partners are in here, but we could not have done that without that backbone, without that downtrace framework that's been there for years. That was there in an emblematic way when I was a lieutenant, but now is at full fruition and it allows us the agility that we need in the Department of Defense to train and work with our partners and or train Ukrainians. <clears throat> so that's the first one. The second one would be to build combat credible forces. What I told the chief, Randy George, is, and if you listen to what I'm telling you here, my, my lines of effort are pretty close to his. War fighting, you know, build combat credible forces. So you, we build readiness in Europe, and we build readiness for Europe but we also build readiness for the United States Army that might be used other places. I don't know, turn the news on, you see what's going on right now. Some of those forces may be asked to be used in other places. Charlie Flynn, my wingman, is right now doing a, a, a similar session and they may have to go there. So you can come to Grafenvir, you can train in Poland, you can train with our European friends and U.S. forces get stronger when they train with Will Sue, who I see out there from the 41st Brigade. So this isn't readiness for Europe's sake. It's, and you heard the chief say that. We're not, a, we're not a European army. We're not a this army. We're a global army. So that's the way I, I view that. And then thirdly, continuous transformation. You may have heard that as well from the chief. So we're all about that as well. And then fourthly, and most priority for me, is to build at scale interoperability and interchangeability with our allied forces here. I, that's where I spend the most of my time uh, in that effort. The first one, war fighting skills, and then building and helping our partners get at scale. You know, our partners were with us for the last 10, 15 years in and out of Afghanistan, and it was all about away games. It was all about, you know, preparing to go to Afghanistan. Now we're talking about large scale combat operations, and there's not a place that it's more extant than on the continent of Europe. That's what we're about. Um, and so I think that's sort of what we do in terms of my pure UCOM, back to the Army. I'm the voice back to the Army, both for Todd Wasman and both for John Kalashevsky. My NATO hat, a lot of change there. Post Vilnius, everybody knows post Vilnius, three regional plans, right? 360 AROI. Now, for the first time in NATO, it's exciting. We actually have plans which will drive national plans operational plans, the plans that we are rewriting right now, uh, if we had to fight that. What do you mean by that? So my headquarters, USER headquarters, lots of acronyms here. CFLIC, right? We'll be, I will be the CFLIC commander if we have to do this tonight. The multi-core capable land component command, which will work for JFC Brunson. I know there's a lot of acronyms out here. I, I, you know, I, I apologize for that. but. General Luigi Miliata, who's the Brunson commander. Let me back up. So General Caboli is now the supported commander in NATO, and all stop. Every other commander in NATO supports him in that role. Me as the LANDCOM commander with my NATO hat, I write the coherent uh, land plans, the SSPL, lots of acronyms, I apologize. But the land plan, which provides coherence to all of you all looking out there. And so I'm responsible for AORY 360 in NATO. I'm responsible for, and here's the reality, Lieutenant General Andy Rowling will be the land component command supporting General Miliate and Brunson if we go to war tonight. In my LANCOM hat, I have another headquarters down in Izmir, Turkey. General uh, Nick Zanelli will be the land component command supporting JFC Naples and Admiral Stu Munch. Um, so that's sort of the coherency, more C2 to follow. If you've got questions about that, I'm sure there are questions about C2. Always is. Um, I'll leave it sort of there. Africa. About 2,000 soldiers on the continent, active guard and reserve, providing support to the ambassador in support of Todd Wasman. What we really provide is a JTF scalable headquarters that can do things like Sudan, like Niger, and Todd's team did that expertly in the last few months, working for dot, 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 the AFRICOM commander uh, on the continent. A little bit scaled, right? We had the security, you know, the SFABs, as I'm sure you're well of, well of. Uh, the, um, 
cooperative security locations, persistent presence on the continent starting in uh, Senegal, Ghana, Gabon, uh, Chad, and over into Uganda, that belt through there. And then he has non-persistent uh, presence as well that he moves in, on and off the continent. All components, Active Guard Reserve, couldn't do it without you. Love the state partnership program, couldn't do the mission without it, both in Europe and Africa. Um, you saw it on full display where we had the 18th Airborne Corps, C.D. Donahue, come over and be superordinate to the uh, evacuation that we did in Sudan and then hand it off to a two-star commander for the rest of that execution. So great agility. Todd does a lot of work. We do some uh, key leader uh, protection, if you will, enablement in the, in the country of Libya that comes up time to time. So a, a large uh, portfolio that General Wasman is responsible for on the continent of Africa. So that's Africa, NATO, Europe. And then what I sit on, and, and Jack alluded to, and I'll, I'll sort of stop there, is Ukraine. Because it's uh, the Ukraine fight, I am one of the components that sits on, if you come to visit me in Wiesbaden, the Security Assistance Group Ukraine, SAGU, is adjoined to my headquarters. And Lieutenant General Tony Agudo, you know, so John Kolosiewski, Assure and Deter, working with our allies. Tony Agudo down and in, enabling our Ukrainian partners um, with consolidated, in fact, the, uh, the, I think the next round of uh, IDCC is tomorrow, working with the Ukrainian partners and enabling their effort throughout the theater with the 21st TSC and all the things I mentioned before. So, triple-hatted with a focus day-to-day -day, uh, on Ukraine. All of the components are in that space because this is Europe and land matters and land has priority. Um, it, it has my attention uh, every single day. So I think I'll stop there, look forward to your questions, and uh, I think I'll be followed by the ambassador. Over to you, madam. Excellent. Um, well, it is really an honor to be here at my first AUSA. Um, so I'm already plotting on how the State Department can do something n not at all similar, much smaller, um, but in coordination with. Um, and really, it's a pleasure and an honor, and thank you very much, General Williams, for the invitation um, to be part of this conversation and to talk about Africa. Um, General Valimaki also to talk about the relationship between NATO and Africa, to talk about the relationship between Europe and Africa, allies and partners. And you might be saying, why Africa? Because most of what you hear about on the news or most of what you see might say, well, why would we even be looking in this region? But the chief said, we need to look to the future. And so if you're looking to the future, you need to look at Africa. And so I'll start with President Biden's words, who said, Africa is critical to advancing our global priorities. These are the first words of the White House US strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa. He said, Africa's success is the world's success. And so at this inflection point in our geopolitical environment, we need only to look at the data. Africa is enormous, its geography and its population. If I were um, a DOD person, I would have my slides up and you'd be able to physically see how the United States fits inside of the continent of Africa and how much space there is left. Um, there, it's a, a home to 1.5 billion people. By 2050, one in every four human beings will be African. Africa is the youngest continent in the world with 60% of the population under the age of 25. It is close. We could fly to Dakar, Senegal in less time than it takes to fly from DC to Helsinki. And look across our ocean, our Atlantic, um, Africa presents enormous opportunities for Atlantic cooperation to foster collaboration and uphold shared principles. Africa is the last and largest emerging market. This is important for all of us industry representatives here. It offers unmatched opportunities to diversify our supply chain, expand consumer prospects, and invest in some of the world's fastest growing economies. The Africa Continental Free Trade Area will bring together 54 countries by geography, the, the world's largest trading bloc. 
And let's talk about critical minerals linked to our economic and energy prosperity. The African continent contains 85% of the world's manganese, 80% of the world's platinum and chromium, 47% of cobalt, and 40% of the world's gold. It has the world's most important rainforest, carbon sink. And on the tech front, nine out of every 10 Africans now own a cell phone. And there's a booming startup and disruptor culture sweeping the continent with some of the most innovative technologies emerging from its ambitious and youthful populations. There is innovation from which we can learn. And at the same time, the Sahel is also the most impacted region in the world for terrorism. It now accounts for 43% of global terrorism deaths. In this region, the war against terror is not over. Countries led by non-constitutionally elected governments span from the Red Sea in East Africa all the way across the continent into the Atlantic. And so it's in the interest of the United States to engage across Africa in all sectors. And security, war fighting, is key to creating this enabling environment. Land power is necessary, but alone it is not sufficient. We need to be continuously transforming. We need to cultivate security ecosystems, and our success hinges on our ability to connect with the people in diverse communities across these 54 countries. We must deliver democratic dividends, peace dividends, to show the benefits of our partnership in the daily lives of those in uniform and civilian populations who share our aspirations for a better future. And so I offer the following three themes to see how we can situate our conversation about the future. First, partnerships to strengthen the rules-based order. Second, cultivating a people-centered security ecosystem. And finally, winning strategic competition and how we can outpace our challengers in Africa. First, partnerships to strengthen the rules-based order. Africa's governments and institutions and people are central in how we solve global challenges. African countries are critical to strengthen an open and stable international system. When they're choosing between systems, they should choose the international system to which we adhere. And our partners across the continent will shape the rules of the world on key issues like trade, cyber, and emerging technologies, and our ability to confront transnational threats like terrorism and crime, and the ways in which we work in multilateral institutions like the United Nations. If you look at Africa, it's 54 votes. When we're looking for support for Ukraine and we need votes, we best have those relationships in place when we're looking for votes. Africa is vital to US national security interests and to reforming those international institutions and multilateral structures, which may have served very well in the past, but to which we must look differently to transform into the future. The US and Finland and our allies are diversifying and deepening our relationships with African countries. And the United States was the first partner nation to establish a mission to the African Union one multilateral organization reaching to 55 members. Others have followed. NATO now has a liaison office at the AU headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. NATO supports the African Union with logistics and training and airlift and sea lift. Um, and this relationship has evolved based on parity, mutual respect, and reciprocity. NATO allies are committed to expanding strategic partnerships with Africa to address shared security challenges, global security challenges. It's not just African solutions to African problems. These are African partners who are key to solving global problems. And our strategic competitors are investing in Africa for the long term, so we best invest more and now. Russia and China have historic ties and influence throughout the region. They are leveraging these relationships with a growing presence across Africa, with embassies and with presence. And malign actors are tempting, um, offer tempting alternatives to, in defense and security assistance. Did you know that while waging war in Ukraine, Russia has overtaken China as the number one arms 
supplier to African militaries. Russia has supplied 26% of the artillery, of the artillery imported to Sub-Saharan Africa over the last five years. These equipment transfers are significant and they are concerning. It should be the United States who is providing this material, not actors who are seeking to upend the international rules-based order designed for the security and development of our global community. And so at this inflection point, we must offer better alternatives than our competitors. We must be agile. We must be transformative. At the US Embassy in Cote d'Ivoire, that's certainly exactly what we are trying to do. We are engaging with our partners on equal footing to address global challenges, to find innovative solutions, and to collaborate to further our collective interests and values. President Biden has prioritized coastal West Africa, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Guinea, and of course, Cote d'Ivoire through the US strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability. We are empowering partners across our region to build resilient communities and the conditions for peace. And this strategy is a 10-year strategy that was passed into law in 2019 with bipartisan support to redefine how the United States prevents violence and advances stability in areas vulnerable to conflict. And this strategy uses a partner-based, whole-of-government approach to fostering peace and stability. It tells us, mandates us, to work across the three Ds, diplomacy, development, and defense, in that order. That's what we're mandated to do, <laughs> at least in a day-to-day -day land. Um, for, but for today, we can put defense at the, at the top. Um, our security assistance and cooperation are strengthening institutions, the foundation of this rules-based order. But to be meaningful, our assistance must deliver for the people. They must feel it in their day-to-day -day lives. And so with that, I'd like to just move to a second theme is how do we build what we call, at least here in Abidjan, um, people-centered security ecosystems. And this is not the language that we offered. This is actually the language that Nivari in general spoke to when he talked about how he described the work that he's doing. He said, we are doing people-focused um, work. And this is from a, a general um, commanding the gendarmerie. And so in Cote d'Ivoire, our, our priorities are to strengthen our partner's defense and security force capacity to effectively secure its land and maritime borders, not doing it for them, but giving them the enablers to do it for themselves, to counter terrorism and violent extremism and improve the accountability of security forces to the people of Cote d'Ivoire, and to be effective in these diverse security ecosystems across the continent, our interventions must be agile. While we are working with Cote d'Ivoire, we need to encourage Cote d'Ivoire to work with its neighbors. We must adapt to the different vulnerabilities. So for example, in East Africa, our strategy planning and execution um, on security assistance for, Somali, for Somalia and the Horn of Africa is driven by the regional conflict dynamics there and the enduring men menace of al-Shabaab that poses a threat to the homeland. In West Africa, our security assistance and partnerships are navigating concurrent threats of terrorism and extra-constitutional actions and Wagner-Russian expansion, creating a heightened sense of instability and insecurity. And so in this context, we are trying to continue to do our work in the Sahel but our investments have scaled up only after the prevention window has already closed. The ebb and flow of the blurred Al-Qaeda and Islamic State affiliates that you mentioned in Burkina Faso, in Mali, and in Niger have created unique and complex exurgent dynamics. This is no longer prevention in these areas. And it's also a region where Russia is gaining a greater foothold every single day. In the Sahel, our investment today is more costly than it was in the past now that the prevention window has closed. And the reason faces acute threats of terrorism, 
Wagner expansion, as well as systemic threats like climate change. And so by using the strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability, we are seeking to learn from the lessons in the Sahel and to do things differently in coastal West Africa. We must adapt to the different opportunities in each region, and there are many opportunities. And the United States, in order to be able to really seize on these, institutions, on, on these opportunities, must stand with the people in each of these regions. We must be seen as not just working with the governments, but working with the people, strengthening institutions. Strong institutions is what we are building with agile, engaged work. New alliances are taking root, and competitors are flexing their muscle. Malign actors are expanding their influence. And so we must build these security ecosystems this is what's key to strategic deterrence. And we are doing this by executing AFRICOM's four lines of effort through security cooperation, defense engagement, mill-to-mill -mill assistance, and regional military exercises like Flintlock, which Cote d'Ivoire hosted, and where we offered the opportunities for relationship building. These relationships are key. We use these exercises to identify seams to adapt and in May in Abidjan, the United States and Cote d'Ivoire co-hosted the African Land Forces Summit, where we focused on civ mill partnerships because it's critical to be able to continue to support the relationships between security forces. And this is military, but it's also police. It's also gendarmerie, because when we think about land forces in Africa, it's not just military, it's all these other different security forces as well. We are helping to build trust between security forces and the people that they serve. And so this is what African land power networks look like in this security ecosystem. With security, land forces, we are making conditions possible for peace dividends. We are investing in resilient communities and strong institutions so that they can build economic prosperity. They can create jobs. Through a holistic approach, we can succeed in supporting our African partners' nation's ability to reinforce sovereignty and strengthen governance to withstand insurgent and malicious actors seeking to destabilize nations and regions that are very close to us. And finally, winning strategic competition because we will win. This will defend. Yet war fighting alone is not sufficient in Africa or elsewhere. Land power is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We must catalyze an all of America strategic approach to truly unleash our power. And the United States must act where we have unique advantage in conjunction with our security assistance our hard power, we must also strategically unleash what some might call our soft power. And this must be strategically combined. Our soft power is our cultural power. Our cultural power that is grounded in the America interpreted through the lens of Hollywood films. Our music that streams across platforms worldwide. Athletics, arts, gaming, AI, emerging tech and entertainment. American brands are recognized and preferred by the growing middle class across Africa and worldwide. Our industry is vital. We are using language to open opportunities. Young people are learning English. We are expanding American centers across Africa. We are connecting with people. We are encouraging and learning from good ideas. And this is power that far outpaces any of our competitors. American aspirations, freedom, justice, equality, are values that we share with our African partners and our allies. A resilient, people-centered security ecosystems makes this possible. Partnerships, relationships are the foundations for our success. We will win by investing in people. So at this inflection point in our geopolitical environment, 
it calls for a more strategic all of America approach. And we are answering this call. I close with the words of President Biden. Africa's success and prosperity is essential to ensuring a better future for all of us, not just for Africa. It's about the future, our shared future. Thank you. Thank you, and I think now we transition from competition to deterrence. General Valamaki. Jack, uh, thank you. Um, General Williams, Madam Ambas Ambassador, distinguished audience, can you imagine how I'm feeling now after such an eloquent talk? <laughs> and now you're going to see my PowerPoints. It's like going to comics, <laughs> comic books. So, uh, but anyways, I'll, it's a true privilege to be here today, my second AUSA, uh, and I hope not the last one. Next one, please. So, as a NATO's new member, and a frontline nation, we bring not only the 1,340 kilometers of Russian border, but also relevant military capabilities and combat formations built for national defense. Now, military geography changes quite slowly. The map of the Russian invasion in the late 1939 depicts well the main avenues of approaches to Finland, which all are still relevant uh, for maneuver as well as for sustainment. And note, there's only five roads above the Arctic Circle, so it's very narrow. Uh, the Russian aggression taking place simultaneously all along the 1,340 kilometers, more or less the same happened a year and a half ago in February in Ukraine. History does not repeat itself, but we should learn from history and keep in mind 1939 then 1941 and all those things that followed up and the Russians learned as they fought through the Second World War. From land power perspective, uh, Fenoskandia is a unified battle space. We should sometimes look at the map without borders, especially from the land perspective. It gives you new ideas on how to operate. So looking from that map, it's pretty obvious that Sweden, Norway and Finland have a lot in common, common interest up in the north. And how we cooperate up north is purely logical for us. And that's, it's quite easy, even though the Finns don't speak much Swedish or Scandinavian. <laughs> from war fighting perspective, uh, I feel that it's very important that we're looking at air, land, maritime, uh, multi-domain from the very beginning. So it's an integrated battle starting from the Arctic going to the Baltic Sea region. It is not a Viking hub nor a Nordic bloc. It is part of the, uh, the whole entity of, of uh, NATO's eastern, uh, northeast front. Next slide, please. And so what have we learned from Ukraine um, so far? From a Finnish perspective, one of the things is that, that if we try to imitate or think like the Russians, we're probably going to fail the same way that they had flaw assumptions in the beginning that they thought that it would be a parade walk into Ukraine. So does conventional deterrence work if the other side does not use the same calculus as we do? From a good point from the Finns was that local knowledge, citizen soldiers, good basic soldiering skills, and the will to defend, even if the outcome seems uncertain. Fast mobilization, ability to take initiative, save the day in February 22. So we feel that we are doing more or less the same thing, so tick in the box, we're, we're good on that. To conduct conventional land operations on a large, a large front requires mass of everything. It becomes a war of attrition competition of war material production. And I think that this has not really been understood even if, even if it has been talked about. From transparency, it's interesting. Um, I think at least in Finland, we have to rethink our ways we conduct combined arms operations. Because of transparency uh, in its various forms, we will need to be able to overpower enemy sensors, either by deception or signature management disperse, protect, and consolidate forces for decisive actions. 
dynamically mass precision fires to shape and destroy, targeting to be done faster and more effectively than before. And finally, protecting our sustainment and enablers in our own depth. Data, AI, and the ability to use data, use commercial IT in its various forms, has to be done better than today. Data-based command decisions throughout the different command levels. And Russia is not going anywhere. So Russia's ability to adapt is, is something that we have to understand. And now uh, we are, once the, once the war in Ukraine stops, which it eventually does at some point, then it will, we are in a race of reconstitution of forces and stocks. And they are adapting and we'll see the force flow coming back to their garrisons, now filling up with combat experienced forces. In Finland, we have two swim lanes of change. One is to maintain and improve our readiness over the current force with incremental improvements. And the other one is to innovate and implement fast, implement fast new ways and means. I'll get back to this a bit later. So, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, do we have the will? Do we have the motivation to defend Finland? This uh, questionnaire has been done in, uh, for several decades and the results have been consistent and clear. In order to fight and to train and equip relevant combat formations, a nation needs the will to defend itself, even if the result seems uncertain. We finish, we're not very talkative, but we sure are stubborn and <laughs> appreciate our, a bit, uh, our independence. Next slide, please. About the capacity, do we have the capacity? I, I think we do. We have trained personnel in the reserves. Conscription, National Service and Women's Voluntary Conscript Service provides the Finnish Defence Forces as a whole the possibility to reach out and utilise the whole pool of national talent. This of course helps us in developing interoperability, innovating new ways and means and it improves our national resilience. I'm not trying to convince anyone that our reservists can outperform all voluntary force active duty personnel. What I'm saying is that our numbers and motivated pool of talent has a quality of its own. Our training and exercise system is tailored to this end. Next slide, please. A few things about capabilities. We have a large reserve, so we need a lot of hardware. Traditionally, we do pretty well the close fight. But the deep and the deep fight, we have developed a limited capability for joint strike capability for F-18s, JASM and JSO and Gimlers. And we have the required targeting capability in country. The Finnish multi-domain fight was tailored for Finland and it to include all aspects of the Finnish society. Now we're stepping up our efforts to integrate our capabilities with allied forces and allied capabilities. Currently, we're working quite hard on air land integration and inter interoperability with specifically U United States. The first Finnish JJIG, <coughs> Joint Air Ground inter Integration Cell, is being developed as we speak with the great support of 10 Mountain Division personnel. And this is part of Victory Corps and USRAF interoperability efforts. On the swim lane one, we got a, a significant uh, appropriation bill in March 22, 2 billion euros to improve our uh, forces readiness, reservist training, procurement spare parts, consumables, tires, tracks, engines, maintenance costs, more Patria APCs, South Korean K9s and so forth. We actually adjusted our procurement uh, procedures in weeks in order to make this happen. So it's doable, based on urgent operational requirements at the national level. So our modernization has started, but we need to look at uh, new ways, and this is the swim lane too, looking at the new ways of doing things, loitering weapons as part of the artillery, UAS, counter UAS at all levels, commercial solutions like ice eye, as a, as a synthetic aperture radar, radar capability, AI and big data. And it will be, of course, logical to do this with allies and key partners. Next slide, please. 
So please note that 7% of our forces are active duty. 93% are reservists. So how do we operate? Mostly in darkness and cold. <laughs> or wet and chilly, which we call summer. <laughs> so the terrain and conditions we fight, uh, train to fight, differ from one season to another, from one region to another, which makes life interesting. Bottom line is that the MDO, Combined Arms Operation, Close Deep, C2, ISTA, all that, ha all that sustainment has to be done according to the conditions. And you have to train. It's, uh, the manuals and doctrines are nice, but they won't help you in the cold up north when it's dark. Troops aiming to function in Finland must be trained, and I think this goes large also to Norway. You have to train and be equipped to operate in the north. In non contiguous compartmentalized terrain, ability to operate independent of ground lines of communications is essential. Extend operational reach through li limited self-sustainment, signature management, balancing individual soldiers' loads and movement. The ability to operate in cold weather is, well, that's quite obvious. The GPS and CIS will let you down, either because of electronic warfare or by just physics. Finns, Swedes, Norwegians, we train regularly. In the past two years, we have stepped up from company level exercises to battalion level and for longer periods of time. This year, we have had the privilege to have the Virginia National Guard training in Finland, 11 Arctic Airborne, the Arctic Angels, 10 Mountain Division, and 1-8 CAV from 4-ID. And next year, we'll be stepping up, probably uh, we're ready to receive an IBCT in uh, part of the Steadfast Defender. So we're stepping up the game in many ways. Next slide, please. And just to say, just to give you a glimpse on how, how fast we're doing, this year, in the spring, we got accredited for ASCA. So we had Norwegian, they, they are in there, you can't see them, but that, you see the safety and security guy, but so the forward <laughs> observers, Norwegian forward, forward observers were there, and we were firing K-9s, and, that, and uh, we did the same with the uh, launchers from the UK, Finland, and, and United States. But that had to be done with a swivel chair because we didn't have MPE yet. Now we have, thanks to your, your support, sir, this uh, G6 from USARAF has now provided us with the uh, required capability. Next slide, so next year, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna step up the game. So dynamic front in the fall next year, we'll hopefully have the same a rocket artillery, but this time we'll have, and we're aiming for higher, uh, faster, with fully digitalized uh, capabilities, and in time, when the, when the Estonians have high Mars, to include them into the whole set, so we'll, this will create a new set of problems for our eastern neighbor. And when, you, when we have uh, A2 capabilities with PRISM, then we have even more capabilities combat aviation, Finland bought uh, 30, uh, 64 F-35. So that is a sundown for the F-18s has already started. So by end of the decade, we'll have F-35s. And then we have to be, as an army, as a land force, ready to integrate with the F-35s. So uh, a lot of work to be done, but at the same time, we're fast paced going forward. Uh, we're not going to take off the the right, uh, right leg from the pedal, which is pushing it forward. So, thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, we have three microphone positions. Um, and if you have questions, or rather, when you have questions, please make your way to one of those microphones and we'll call you up. But while people are thinking of what they want to ask and positioning themselves, um, I'm going to just pose a couple of questions of my own. So, um, General Valamaki, that was a fantastic overview of where you're going in terms of national defense. And I think many people in this room, myself included, have visited Finland and been absolutely astounded by the level of readiness, the careful 
nature of your preparations and planning for national defense. But in entering NATO, you also need to come to the aid uh, of your allies in other, in other areas, um, facing Africa, for example. And so you now require the ability to operate beyond your own borders. Um, could you kind of indicate how you are preparing to take on that mission set? And I appreciate it's a process. It's not something that you immediately step up and do. Thank you, Jack. Very kind question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if I'll start by saying that okay, we have deployed troops to Mali. We have tro troops uh, to Bo the Balkans, Iraq, Afghanistan. So I think the deployability is something that is not new. However, I have to say that the NDPP, the NATO Defense Planning Process, sets up requirements for us. And we got the first package, and we are working on it. And that includes the deployability. How do we do it? Slow pace. We're Finns, we're slow, but we get, we, we'll get there. Um, the ARF is one thing that we're looking into, of course. Uh, first, probably by air and, and naval capabilities, and then in time, also army. Uh, we have to think about 360. We, we, we are national defense, defense forces, and we joined a defensive alliance. So it's sort of a obvious that we are in the same ball game. And, and then understanding 360, and we have capabilities which we are then have to very carefully talk and, and then prepare for deployability also. So I'm not promising anything yet, but we're working on it. So otherwise I might get a phone call from my boss and saying you can leave the keys on the desk. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want that to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Madam Ambassador, I'd be very curious, noting that defense was the third in your, in your trio. Uh, I think the military often does the same thing, right? Because we talk about the joint force. And then we talk about the combined joint force, so with allies. And then we talk about CJ ATIF, you know, combined joint interagency task force. Um, and suddenly we're lumping all of the civilian capabilities across government into one letter in the acronym. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd be really interested in your perspective on what is the value in competition where land forces are supporting you, right? You're, you're directing the strategy. Um, what is the greatest utility that you get out of land forces in delivering the other effects that you can deliver that land forces can support but can't do themselves? Um, I think in Africa in particular, I mean, the general talked about the kind of presence that the United States military has across the continent. You're talking about 54 countries. Um, there is an economy of scale that we have when we work through multilateral organizations. Um, there is efficiencies that we can have when we don't necessarily have a whole new line of effort, but we have the unique capacity, the unique training, the unique perspectives that a trained warfighter has that they can bring at in a theater in what I'd like to call like kind of a just in time kind of assistance. So while we have specific long term lines of effort, which are extremely important to building institutions, to build professionalism, to build the accountability of militaries across the continent, that takes time. Today, we can show up, and when we show up, a trained warfighter with expertise on logistics, on other different capacities that you have to be able to put in front of a partner that says the United States is invested in you, which is important, especially at a moment where Russia is showing up or Wagner or some other permutation of that in all of these places where we have in some cases pulled back or where we never invested in a grand scale in a grand scale and you know nature does not nature abhors a vacuum and Russia loves a vacuum so it's extremely important for us in our diplomatic work and our development work to be able to demonstrate the force that is available 
even if it's not there at present. I'm representing one country in Cote d'Ivoire, but we have embassies across the continent of Africa, some which are very large um, and some which are very small or non-existent or covered from another country. Having a force, having a land power professional come and show up demonstrates that the United States is interested. And I always, um, and I know that many of my colleagues here will say, you don't have to decide. Even if you're based in one place, that doesn't mean you have to decide on one country among 54 or three countries among 54. We're the United States. We can be in all of those countries. It might not be a persistent presence, but it is presence enough to show up and to say you matter and to say that we care and we want to know what conditions they are facing and how the United States can be a better partner. And that is critical for me in my work to be able to say when General Williams comes to visit, you might not see him every single day, but I just want you to know, this is who you have on your side, and that goes a long way. If I could, Jack, uh, please. A little bit to the, the question you asked, uh, Posse. So <clears throat> I didn't talk a lot about the Ford Land Forces trace that uh, now really stretches with Finland coming in this. We've really stretched this guy in ways that he's never been stretched before. He's already moving forces around uh, with the power of this, this great army. So I talked about the three regional plans and then the downtrace tactical planning that has to happen to include incorporating national planning that uh, Posse talked about. If you, if you haven't been around this neck of the woods in a while, you know, we have eight brigades that are the sort of the front porch of the, of the alliance, uh, starting in Estonia all the way down to Romania. There's a framework nation, a host nation, all of NATO's involved with that. SACUR's guidance to me, to the force, is to build this ability to build up from a task force, from a battle group, up to a brigade. Some nations are actually going to move, I've learned from my colleagues in the last few weeks, are going to actually move a forward presence to be permanently stationed in those host nations. So that's sort of the spine, if you will, of NATO. But there are a lot of other things there. National forces, as I mentioned, you have uh, NIFUs there. You have a lot of different acronyms. I won't take you through acronym soup here. But there are forces that are ready to respond on the eastern edge of the alliance right now as we speak, buttressed by divisions and cores. Um, I also have the privilege to work with, and John helps me, the NATO course. So sort of the middle linebackers of Europe, if you will, is multinational core northeast, multinational core southeast, sort of are the, the, the edges, the edges, if you will, it's football season, so I can talk about it. So there's sort of the edges of the, of, um, and they're not classified here, so I gotta be careful, but so the, the edges of that, of that fight. And then there are cores who are gonna be used in different capacities, which we employ as the multi-core capable land component, C-Flick, all those other acronyms. So our job is to find the right combinations, coming back to the question to Posse as well, inclusive of our national interests. Lars is in here, Martin is in here. What hasn't happened in the past is full inclusion of the nations and the fights they'll have to have. Um, the, our Baltic brothers and sisters will draw first contact possibly. So what does their stance look like? What forces do we have there? How are we empowering them? How are they linked to Posse up in Finland, Sweden, hopefully in the future, link with Lars in depth. So NATO in depth and width and the triggers associated with that. And lastly, I'll end, Sakur post Vilnius has secured much more authorities uh, than he has in the past. He can do things now as he gets indications and warnings that he didn't have before to inform the nations, I need this certain stance to be able to do deterrence. We're about deterrence in NATO. And so how do I continue to thicken to use the flexible deterrent options I need to deter him and perhaps kill him at the place and time that I need to? So that's a little more around uh, General Valamaki and um, the plans that we are writing right now for the first, one last thing, I know I said last twice now, but um, for those of you been in NATO and Europe, we had these Ocasio exercises that we did. That was so we fought, no more. 
We will fight the people we're going to fight now. I made that very clear to Sakir. Sakir supports it. So next year, we're not going to be, there's an exercise going on right now. It's called Steadfast Jupiter, which I'll run back, get, I'm get on a plane tonight and go back and participate in. Not quite fit for purpose this year. It is not representative of post fillness. Next year, our exercise construct will be ever, it's strong now, but it'll be even stronger because we're going to fight the enemy we're going to fight. We're going to practice that way with all of our alliance. Austere challenge in March. Um, in fact, John at the end of the month is, is running the CPX. So remember, support it, Commander General Cavoli, operationalizing NATO headquarters. CFLEC headquarters, I'll be next, right? You come. John Kolosheski will be underneath me. You'll have a British division, you'll have an Estonian division, you'll have 1st Infantry Division and 3rd Infantry Division all working in March to work those exercises and bring vitality and strength that we've never had in NATO before. So it's an exciting time. So, do we have any questions out in the audience? I don't see lines forming. Uh, I, right. I, I can keep going. You've got a question? Right to the mic, brother. Come to the mic. Do, are we recording this? Because yeah. if we are, then if are. you're not at the mic, then uh, those who want to watch it afterwards won't get what you say. Do we sound? Do we have sound? Yep, you're on. Thank All right. Um, Florian Eberhard, uh, working with Cold CZ Group. Um, and um, well, I got a question. Dr. Watling, I'm a big fan of, of uh, our USI's work, actually. And I guess my questions are interconnected, interconnected and they go to Generals William and uh, Valley Mackey. And um, so three questions. Um, basically, what are the most important learnings for ground forces in Ukraine for you? And um, specifically, what is the future of maneuver warfare, you know, kind of in a transparent battlefield? And um, is Ukraine's current offensive in the South, according to you, an anomaly? Or uh, that is due to a lack of capabilities? Or is it a glimpse of how you see the future of maneuver warfare also for NATO. Thank you so much. Thank you. The easy questions. <laughs> uh, General uh, Garner. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Let me start. So um, lessons learned, and I'll let my distinguished colleague give his, he gave some of them in his brief. Um, mass matters, uh, large-scale combat operations. Um, it's easier to be on the defense than it is on the offense. Um, the offense, uh, and I'll speak once again, those, um, the real power, if you didn't catch from my opening pitch, the real power of having me triple, quadruple hatted is I can move in and out of these different mission sets, uh, hopefully somewhat agilely. Um, I will tell you that um, um, the synchronization, synchronization of offensive operations, um, the idea that you fire and maneuver, not fire them maneuver, is something that uh, we're working very closely with. Uh, we, we would also have trouble, you, I'm, once again, put my U.S. hat on here, with some of the very, very complex obstacles that are out in front of them. Um, but I will tell you, for I'm an artilleryman, so uh, folks, saucer drills and things like that, how do you take down obstacles in depth? Um, uh, the Ukrainians are doing that very admirably and uh, with great courage, but it's hard work. Uh, we spend, you know, years and years at our training centers at the the, comp at the platoon company task force level trying to integrate and build commanders to do very complex uh, breaching operations. So I would say those two lessons learned that mass matters like it never has before. It has a, as a, as a characteristic all along, and the offense is harder than the defense. Duh. But uh, we're seeing that play out. Um, your second question, or or, or uh, your thoughts, um, you know, dealt with how do we get around um, a future maneuver, and is this an example of that? And um, I think um, if you can be seen, we t I talked a lot with Jim Rainey. If you can be seen on this battlefield, you can be hit. Uh, I've watched the Russians over the last 16 or so months that I've been there make adjustments to because the Ukrainians are laying wood to them. And uh, I, I've got, you know, when C.D. Donahue and was over there and now that Tony Agudo's over there, we've got stills of their C2 structure. And I've seen pictures where they were out in the open, like, you know, you can't hit me, 
to now a little bit of security to now where we have to hunt them, where they have to hunt them, and they are. And um, so if you can be seen, you have to be able to hide in plain sight. You have to be able to hide your electronic means, all of that, your physical means and also your electronic signature. The chief talked about that a little bit at lunch. Uh, you have to be able to do. You have to be able to hide in all of this. And Ukrainians are masters at this. They're really good at that. And then finally, um, I won't comment too much about what's going on because we, we have a live operation that's going on. Um, they are exhibiting tremendous courage. Uh, they will breach, uh, and they will put the Russians on a dilemma here. And I think I'll leave that third one along. I'll turn it over to General Balamaki. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll, I'll just raise three things that I have probably said yet. One is the sustainment piece. So when we are for a longer period of time operating, whether it's war or deterrence operation, we need to have the sustainment piece right. And, and Russia it has gone to war footing with their industry, good or bad high quality or low, it doesn't matter. They're, they're doing different things differently. And if I think some numbers, and, and Jack might help me with this, but uh, now Russia is using about three to 4% of their GDP during Second World War. It was 60% of their GDP went for the war economy. So understanding that, so how do we do repairs, modify on the run, um, repairs, at the battlefield as close as possible, and we should learn from what the Ukrainians are doing now. And we should learn from what 21 TSC has done in, in pushing through material in huge quantities. So that's it, the sustainment piece is one. Uh, reserves, we need reserves. So we know how to do reserves, but those who have gone to all voluntary military some have lost the, the capability of how to build up reserves. And it takes time to build the reserves. It takes years to get an officer, a general staff officer. It takes years. So how do you build reserves? You have to think about that in order to sustain fight and casualties. Casualties will take place. And last one is about drones. How do you do 3D printing? so that you can do it, that 3D printing already in the front line as cl close as you can to replace small gadgets and small things and get the drones up flying. And then how do you build the sensor feeds into AI boxes to provide that data as fast as possible so that you get fire, fire missions and direct fires faster and faster. So you use less ammo which means you can think about what else can, yeah, I'm going to hit, not just hitting one place. Thanks. Cool, cool. Any additional questions? Otherwise, otherwise I just got to keep firing. OK, cool. Up front. Mike Pierce, Dr. Mike Pierce, um, formerly worked uh, in the G3 over at USWR when uh, General Williams You want to come back? Here. <laughs> hey, you know, I got a, I got a whole load of story for that one. <laughs> um, we happened to be doing an exercise over in uh, Germany from uh, uh, USWR headquarters, and we went over to Russia, flew over Exercise Torgau 2005, and uh, Lana just stay. thank you for, first of all, thanks for hooking me up with that great hotel in Moscow. <laughs> great uh, exercise, and it was the Americans and the Russians. Um, we did an exercise first over there. In, in my, around the Moscow area, and then an exercise uh, back in Graf. And so I'm wondering, number one, the road turned, and then, you know, as we look back on it, now almost 20 years later, um, you know, lessons learned from that and that experience, because at that time, uh, we're all sitting there having toast together, uh, General Dempsey singing in his tenor voice, singing his Irish song. I don't even know what one it was, but we're all in there. You know, we're, 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 we're working together. I mean, it's such a, such a great potential. Yeah. Uh, and then it just kind of went out. And I remember I was with the XO from the general, uh, Bulgakov. And, you know, we're sitting in there. And their perception, at that time, he shared with me their thoughts of where they were in the world. And I just want to 
again, part of this is that you know, they looked at it as they saw themselves as kind of an, a successor of a certain type of um, mindset, cultural mindset that started, you know, all the way from the Byzantine, and then they saw themselves with this successor of this kind of order, if you will. And not his thinking that was that they didn't see us as the bad guys. They saw us as comrades being a development of friendship. And after about half a bottle of vodka, I, I felt like that too. Just joking. But I mean, the point is that where, where we went to and where we are now, so I'd just like if you could ex just share a little bit of that because you've seen that and you see so much more. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so he was talking about Torgau. We, there was a little respite in there where Torgau was um, an exercise. We talked about exercises earlier where they tried to replicate when the Americans linked up with the Russians on the Elbe River. And so for a short period there, I was chief of exercises for Eustra at the time. And we put together this for two or three years there, a very short time there, and had the opportunity to kind of look behind the curtain. Um, for me, I'll, I'll just sort of respond. Um, many of the assumptions about them that are being played out now that Posse and others know and Madam Ambassador are sort of validated. What I saw at that time was a lot of hierarchy, hierarchy, um, not a whole lot of trust. You know, the real, what distinguishes the United States, what I often say, what distinguishes Western armies and certainly the U.S. Army is our non-commissioned officer corps. You heard the chief um, congratulate or, or recognize our command sergeant majors earlier. The ability to do mission command at the lower levels. You know, those early days last year, you saw, you saw convoys stuck, and that's a sergeant putting a boot up someone's butt, right, to get, this, to get the stuff moving. They didn't have it then, they still don't have it. So it's sort of a validation in real operational sense what you and I saw in an exercise. Um, that's one thing. So not trust in junior leaders. Um, I remember, I don't know if you went with me, but we went on one of their ranges. And um, a general officer, in, Madam Ambassador, others. So we would have a second lieutenant, lieutenant run a range, right? My son would run a range with, a great, with the help of a lot of non-commissioned officers so he wouldn't screw it up. But um, when I went there on this range, a general officer ran the range. There were colonels that were holding all the paddles on all the range. And I'm like, hmm, what do you think, comrade general? I said, I think we would have kicked your ass is what I think. Uh, but because uh, this, this, this sense of trust and empowerment just didn't. And I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, um, and I think that's what Ukrainians are taking advantage of. The second thing I'll say is, you know, we all, many of you all in the room w were with them since 2014. And I think a lot of the competitive advantages that our, many of you, not just the Americans, many of our allies were in and out of Ukraine for about the last nine or 10 years. And, and I think um, our training, our working with, made the difference and still is making a difference there. So thank you for that. Um, I, Please. I just wanted to also, I mean, one of the, the, the last comment was also a, about what happens to people? What happens to relationships? I mean, you you were partners, and then things changed, and then you are now enemies. What happens? Where? Where? What? What, what steps can we take before that happens? If you've got that relationship, what you know? Is it something? Because it's the same people. And then what is it that changed so that you could work together as comrades on an exercise and then years later are mortal enemies? It wasn't that it was always that way. How can we recognize what those characteristics are or those assumptions so that we can prevent that from happening? I think the first place I worked um, ever in Africa was in Mali in the mid-1990s at that time. The Malians said, you know, when you look all over, you look at Somalia, you look at all these places, you know, thank goodness this could never happen to us here in Mali. We are such peace-loving people. This would never happen in Mali. And yet, Mali is now the epicenter, um, and they, as you said, have chosen to work with Russians. Um, the current Minister of Foreign Affairs was a close colleague at the African Union. Um, we worked together daily on shared goals. What happened? I can't understand from the last time I saw him when we were 
working together on what the, the Africa of tomorrow looks like and what the United States should look like. And we were working on global challenges together um, when they were supporting our goals um, across the world. And now he is spending time in Moscow instead of in the United States. And it's the same person. And I think it goes to what is, you know, how can we, when we build these relationships, be able to continue to, to use these relationships even when those people seem to have strayed? And this is around, I think, I mean, maybe that's some of the work that we do as diplomats all the time, working in these kind of gray areas. But I think as well, for war fighters, because you have these different kinds of common experiences, and what can we do before our allies then become our enemies? Just following up on that, Ambassador, um, you know, it's not just Mali, right? If we look at Burkina Faso, as I say, in 2015, I was with the Burkina Faso military in Mali, working very closely with US and others. Um, and then more recently, the Burkina Bay wanted to have uh, local defense forces, essentially, um, rather than have the main military conducting counterterrorism operations. From our point of view, that looked like arming untrained militias. So there was an unwillingness to do that. Um, but the Russians said they'd provide the weapons. And now you're seeing the Burkina Bay move quite decisively in a certain direction. Um, and when you were laying out your kind of lines of effort, particularly from a security point of view, it w everything you said would have sounded very similar if we were discussing this, say, five, six years ago. But the context has changed. Um, and noting that point about how the same people you suddenly find yourself on in a very different relationship, what lessons do you think you've learned about how we improve how we do our business, right? The strategy that we follow so that we don't continue to see this deterioration of that theater. Um, and General Williams, I don't know whether from, from your point of view, you also have some, some remarks on how you're refining your J5 approach, right? So that it's not a plan in a box, but working with the local partner to maintain that trust. Um, I think, you know, in some ways it's around assumptions because you mentioned Burkina Faso. For us, we said, no, 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 you should not work with this because these are untrained militias. That's how we looked at these people who they were talking about trying to build alliances with. We don't always understand the historical underpinnings of those relationships, what looks like untrained militias to us. When I was working in Somalia, it's like, oh, well, we can't talk to these people. These are the Islamic courts. We will not talk with them until they became president of the country. And so it's very, thankfully, I, I talked to them. I talked to them when they were the Islamic courts. I talked to them before they became the president of the country because we, we, we've learned lessons from that. I mean, Afghanistan is not my area of focus, but currently what is happening in Afghanistan is not what we said we would never do. I think you know, those assumptions about what we never do and this kind of being very definite that is always, I mean, that can be dangerous because it's very much focused on a specific point in time. And our partners and the theaters in which we operate, their time frame is a historical time frame. We're looking at something very often in a matter of months, best case scenario, a couple of years. They're talking about relationships that go back hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. And so our assumptions and context, we must really listen much more differently, um, much more actively, and be agile to be able to be responsive and to be a good partner in those contexts so that we don't keep repeating the same mistakes. Yeah, and I would say, uh, to follow up on the ambassador, you know, the, the UCOM commander, AFRICOM commander, the combatant commander sets the strategic uh, compass, if you will, for his theater, his or her theater. And so I think what the, the lessons learned, if you will, is that you put in enough agility the, uh, that uh, you routinely review. You know, it needs to be, normally the J5 group is longitudinal, looking out 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And so what it causes me to say is that we need to have enough agility in it where you have the branches and sequels, 
where you have and you revalidate or reassess those assumptions you had with the original plan because things change. So you have to have an agility in the combatant commander's plan as a supporting component command. That's what that makes me think about. So. Any more questions from our audience? Yeah, we're talking. For uh, General Williams, so as you stated, mass matters. Um, what changes do you see that need to be implemented or partnerships need to be grown uh, so that you can uh, ensure the pipelines that are both at, that exist at the theater and core level maintain and grow as the theater grows? So especially in large combat operations. So with the bulk of the systemic capabilities residing uh, in the reserve core, how, how do you see those troops being able to uh, immediately be interoperable mm -hmm. and then be there at the time of need? Oh, great question. So um, as the, um, once again, back to the combatant commander, he or she sets the framework for the theater. Um, and I'll just speak very candidly. In both of the theaters, uh, what's missing, so I'll, I'll start with NATO. Um, we have this thing called the force equipment list, right, where um, we go to the nations, uh, we, we come up with a plan, we find the plan, and here's the force we need, we think, to, to do that. Um, one of the areas where we're most lacking is what you just talked about, the enablers, the sustainment. We, and someone mentioned 21st before, Ron is, I didn't see you hiding before, Ron is right down here. Um, he is back to my spine piece, so 56, 21st, 10th double MC, 7th ATC are the glue that knits together the theater where my, the allies come in and engage. Uh, when all the new commanders came in, I, I, I wasn't quick enough to do it last year when I first came in, but this year for the commanders that came in, I gave, look, you're the 21st, you have a U.S. hat, but I've got about 22 hats, so that means you do as well. So they are the, when, when Martin comes to me and says, hey, I wanna, I wanna partner with you, you know, I think we have something to offer to you, Daryl, in terms of logistic and sustainment that, that Posse just talked about. Ron is the point of entry for me to work with our partners. We are, we are um, a little deficient in the enablers we need in the theater to do that. Combat brigades, um, I'll just, because we're not classified in here, we're, we're pretty close. I think we'll have the teeth we need, but it's the stuff that you talked about and, and, and General Valamaki talked about. Um, that are in the reserves, that are, that are not necessarily trained as much, that are critical. Um, as I, you know, I came in as a lieutenant, second lieutenant, you know, two corps, 300,000 soldiers. Now we're very different. Our stance, you know, 10th Mountain, Posse missing, ten, mentioned 10th Mountain. 3ID, Chris is now up in the north and AO Victory north and south. The center of gravity of NATO has moved further east, right, through Finland, down through that eastern bloc. What does that mean? Longer lines of communication. Uh, we're going to have to fight. If we come from the States, we gringos, we U.S., it's going to be contested logistics. So we're going to have to fight our way into this, probably. So how do we protect those long lines of communication to get those enablers there, to support the warfighter who's on the very tactical edge of, of uh, the fight there? So and the same in Africa as well. Todd has done a lot of great work. Uh, the 79th TSC, we have the equivalent of Ron on the continent of Africa. Todd practices all the time. He just got validated this past year. We practice a lot of that in the capstone exercise called African Lion that we will exercise again this year. And it enables us to, to work those lines. We've got a long way to go. And I would tell you, and the ambassador knows this and Todd knows it, logistics in Europe is much different than logistics in Africa. Um, having lived there for about six to seven months, it takes a while uh, to get places. And so we have to have creative solutions to support uh, our great teammates there. So that's a little probably more than you asked for, but thank you. Unless um, General Valamaki wants to come back, then please, can we uh, have your question, which I'm sorry for uh, missing you before. So I, I, as, the, uh, as part of the command that wakes up every morning, <laughs> on behalf of General Williams thinking about Africa. I don't want to lose this opportunity to ask the ambassador a question. Uh, and ma'am, you highlighted that if we, uh, if the window for prevention closes, that the investment required to achieve our objectives with our partners in Africa becomes substantially higher. 
And so how might we help you better uh, achieve prevention so that we can achieve our objectives in a more cost-effective way in all of its measures uh, for, for what would be required to achieve those, ob those objectives. And it's a little bit of a continuation of the, of the discussion we just had about some, you know, some other topics, but I'd be interested in your thoughts about how we can do that better. Um, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I am fortunate um, at our embassy um, in Abidjan. I have a great um, SDO DAT. Um, we have an OSC. Um, that is not the case across the continent. Um, but very often what happens is that um, our partners come where you already have a large presence or a persistent presence, and you revisit the same places over and over, which is great for those places. But then you have these vacuums and this kind of desert, figuratively and actually, um, in all of these other different countries. So I would say the best thing to do is to be able to, when you're doing something in country X, invite the other countries around country X. In coastal West Africa, if the president has decided that you've got five countries, if you're working in any one of those countries, it doesn't cost, I mean, the, the, it's a fraction of a cost to invite the colleagues from those other four countries in whatever country you are um, working. That is something that is extremely efficient and it's building those relationships. Even in situations, and this is some of the things that we've been exploring, even in situations today, um, Secretary Blinken announced that there has been a coup in Niger. That is gonna limit certain kinds of assistance that we can provide, the United States can provide. That doesn't necessarily limit the assistance that Cote d'Ivoire could provide, that Ghana could provide, that Morocco could provide, that Egypt could provide. How do we build on those relationships to offer efficiencies and to be able to act in places where we are constrained either by law or by based capacity? So you, we talked about agility in lots of different ways. I think that we need to be much more innovative in how we approach being agile. Um, if you're talking about a continent that's going to be home to one in four human beings in a matter of years, for us not to have these relationships, not to build them now, we are going to be in trouble, not just in 2050, but I would contend in a couple of years when we won't have access to the minerals, when we won't have access to the people, when we won't have access to markets. This is gonna be a huge disadvantage for the United States and something that Russia, um, for example, or China, for example, are invested hugely in. We are perceived as having written off these different countries. We need to shift that perception today. Now, I would love to just keep going with questions, but um, unfortunately, I am under strict instructions <laughs> to bring this to a close on time, because I think General Velamaki has a meeting with several chiefs of army, and uh, General Williams and, and Madam Ambassador both have flights to catch. Um, so I think rather than doing an, one final question, I'd just say, uh, General, do you want to uh, close with any final thoughts? Beat Navy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thanks, Doc. Um, convergence, uh, if I left you with one thing, as you saw as I was moving around these different hats, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to support the ambassador. It's an honor and privilege to support Posse and my other teammates in here. And USRA at headquarters is going through a transformation. Uh, and so the convergence of those different mission sets, a lot of folks say, hey, it's a challenge. It is a challenge but I look at it as an opportunity. Um, I move in and out of Mike Langley, Chris Cavoli, UCOM commander, SACUR, AFRICOM commander, Army staff, uh, the Corps commanders, the, the chiefs of the Army, the CHODs, ambassadors. Um, USER headquarters is a dynamic place if you're looking for a place to work in the future. <laughs> and so that's the one word I would leave for you is the convergence and the opportunities on the continent of Africa and in Europe, and I'm glad to serve with all of you all. Thank you. Thank you. In which case, I would just invite you all to thank our panel for their expertise and time. Thank you very much.
All right. Thanks, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, doctor.